And when I say data democratization, uh, one of the goals that we set out to do was to facilitate uh, clinical data and access to clinical data to our researchers in a end user drag and drop experience that is led by our CTSI, so it's slightly guided, and to ultimately develop a fully self-service experience. So uh, part of the things that people are talking here are uh, the reasons why we got into such projects. And when I was first hired by our IT group back in 2009, I was told to take over the I2B2 database that was kind of flagging at the time. Um, we decided to, I decided to make it great and put all the things in it. And then from there, I said, you know, people keep on asking me to do data pulls from it because I'm responsible for doing that as well as part of the other hat that I wear. So me being a lazy person said, you know, clinicians know what they want. I know the data, why don't we marry the two together so we can get a uh, similar looking, you know, so they can pull their own data and self-service themselves. So this has been the culmination of that long thought exercise. And uh, you know, as that uh, comic shows on the right, there are some good things behind giving power to the people and there are some gotchas that you get whenever you give power to the people. Um, this is my obligatory slide that I was told to show by our PR group. <laughs> um, this is our uh, I'm busy, you're busy, we're all busy kind of slide. Uh, I was given to it back in 2015 and since then we've added another hospital. And I'm sure we're all related with that problem of how do you get other uh, systems into your system and let it reportable as well. Um, our goal in our university has been to put everything into our EMR, which is epic. Related to that, this is uh, another one of the I'll show you mine, uh, you'll show me yours kind of slides here. Um, our data, March for I2B to our public one, has 2.1 billion observations in it. And we have a, a decent population of our providers, of our 19,000 providers using the system. Um, what's interesting though is it seems to me that they seem to do a lot of their queries at the beginning of the year when their grants are due and their proposals are due. I wonder why. Mm. Um, so we really have two big pathways which we're trying to address here, uh, which is preparatory to research and the need for investigators to get access to some form of data de-identified so they can do some investigations on it and uh, IRB approved projects. And this is where I2B2 was great because preparatory to research, you can use the self-service function to pull your data marks as, uh, to pull your data as you see and run some basic numbers. Uh, we added this feature so that you can actually get some de-identified Excel exports out of that exercise as well. And then we have our IRB approved projects, which we build data marks for them and we re-identify the data on a separate server with on-demand ETLs. So I'll describe that in a little bit. So from our data governance perspective, uh, our investigators apply to use a project, and you'll be surprised how many people will allow that process. Oh wait, I have to apply to get data? I have to get IRB approval? Uh, I guess I won't need that then. <laughs> okay. Um, so we need to get, of course, you know, description of project, you know, some documentation, you know, what are you trying to study? And uh, they fill out a form. That form is then validated by our honest broker who works for CTSI and he ensures that there is a minimal necessary of data that they're getting. And he also acts as our ETL manager because he's the one who works closely with the investigator and knows when they need it. And then lastly, because he's the ETL manager, he's the one who grants access to the data. And this is when a custom uh, data model is created for the investigators. We built our process on top of a WordPress platform for our front end so that we could do our news and uh, other sort of announcements on there. But uh, when the <coughs> investigator logs in, they can initiate a project request and the project request captures uh, what they're trying to do the study for. And you know, we love to give our investigators you know, hints as to where to go next. You know, in this case, we give them the link straight to our institutional form so they can fill out that data request form and remit it to proof here. After that, after you've kind of investigated whether or not it's feasible to do a project, a lot of people get IRB approval, and uh, they then have to fill out this form where they have to upload things such as you know their approval date, so we can lock down the data mark when they're done with it, because you won't know how many people are trying to access uh, three-year-old data after their approval's ended. It's great. 
and uh, for them to upload the data and pick whether or not they are going to upload an Excel document or use a query that they previously run through IGB2. Um, the reason we're asking this is because we are also providing re-identification to stick on PHI and stuff, stick it in a different database. So for those who are familiar with the data in the back end of I2B2, we then let them see this screen, which allows for them to pick data elements within the I2B2 master table access. So they can say, I want this data, or I don't want this data, compliant with the minimal necessary of data that they should be receiving. Now, what is nice is that our system is late bound. And what that means is that when you pick something, and you suppose a flow sheet, you, go, you have to go and figure out, well, what is it about flow sheets I want? I don't want all flow sheets, because otherwise we'd have 3.5 trillion rows of data in our database, mm -hmm. which is great, because we're running out of space all the time. Um, so they get to pick exact flow sheets that they want, and whether or not there's some transform that they want before it goes into the system. Uh, so this way, we're making sure that they only get discharge notes, or they're only getting flow sheets for only diagnostic data. If they chose an Excel spreadsheet uh, for upload, we would show them this screen, which allows for them to pick in some items so that we can match it up with our MPI, which is EPIC, to locate the data. Uh, so of course we need MRN, uh, our local facility MRN, and uh, which facility. Uh, I don't know how many times our investigators have asked me, well, why didn't my thing upload? Did you tell us which hospital it belonged to? No. How would I supposed to know that? Um, in addition, we give them some other ways to find it in case they don't have that information, such as first name and date of birth. And this would then allow for them to see the data if they included it in an export of this nature on the right. So this is an example of a uh, study ontology that is generated using Excel data. Um, we also allow for them to upload any sort of other columns that they want. So if they have a lot more columns that they want to pull data, uh, and they, they throw it in there, like for example, study group. Is this identified or not? Is this in group A or group B getting the medication? They can do that. This is also very, very important for our REDCap integration that we do later. So behind the scene, we take our Excel documents and any data that they do, any data that they've generated from our uh, integrations uh, within our I2B2 uh, uh, plugin, patient enrollment list that they've kept, and we keep them separate. And the reason for that is because our I2B2 is a derivative system, so we really don't want to be putting in data that we can't regenerate from source systems that we do every few months or so. Then we have our uh, separate Java services component, which does the integration, merging, and pivoting of our data. It also does our DBA functions for us because it deletes and creates our, uh, our data marts for each one of our 500 or so individual requesters. And I think this counts currently at 600 because years passed. Um, and I think I'll pause here uh, for a second. This is our master uh, systems diagram, and I'll say that anything over here is standard I2B2. And we've created separate data marts for each one of our projects in a separate database, with <coughs> local observations and local concepts. So this way their Excel data doesn't happen to go and pollute the main data mart for our I2B2 public data mart that they all use. And this also allows for us to do ETLs, so the data is kept up to date for their lab data and their flow sheets and whatnot in the main data mart. So we don't have to ETL it five or six times around the block, because otherwise that's one person's whole job to just manage that. And uh, lastly, it allows for us to maintain the database centrally. So if we want to add concepts like, for example, ICD-10 that we had to do somewhat recently, we could do it in a centralized place without killing everybody. Uh, we then keep our pivoted data that we use for our uh, integrations in a separate uh, little database. Uh, current plans are actually to merge these two together, so the data marts, ETLs, and the, e and the REDCap integration data would now live in the main individual data marts instead of polluting one big table. And lastly, we have some job tables that we use to maintain the system. And the front end. So 
you know, when you ask investigators what do they want to see the data in, the first thing they're going to see is Excel, which I hate. Uh, but, you know, because that's been so useful to our investigators, we've made an Excel uh, plugin, which uh, is part of the project which we've made available to everybody. And it's a drag and drop. It's uh, based on the work that was done previously in uh, FAU and uh, in Europe and allows them to drag and drop data elements in there. Also showing off is our data dictionary tool, which we're not in, I'm not demonstrating today. Um, from our regulators, we are also locking down certain things, so they don't get access to reports that they shouldn't have access to, or lab data results that we have embedded to say is de-identified. So our words for our, best, our uh, regulators there. And uh, lastly, before they get access to any data, we make sure that they at least sign, that they have read the, the things that they were supposed to do, and to make sure that uh, they're not, for preparatory for research, just using the data willy-nilly and then going out and writing a paper. We uh, then audit these things every once in a great while. So, you know, part of the self-service aspect is, you know, the cycle <coughs> of how data flows within our institution. So. The CTSI teaches a class on basic I2B2 use and how to use things like the data dictionary within our system. And you know, where does the data live? And you know, don't look at ICD-9 procedures. You, want to go look, you don't want to look at CPTs. Almost everything's an inpatient procedure. You don't get an outpatient heart attack, you know, heart replacement. Um, you know, so we have those guidelines on ontology use. And then it's also a framework for them to reach out and ask questions. So. Uh, for the next thing, when they go and run an Excel spreadsheet, which they do in the class, you know, they run a sample uh, Excel spreadsheet, it's really great for, you know, one record or one encounter pulls. And, you know, we give them options to pick, like, you know, do you want the min, the max, do you want the first, the last, you know, the second, the last. I think the most absurd request is I've gotten a request for the 39th to last. So 39th to last CBC, thanks. Well, you got to 38. Okay, so there's a fair amount of Excel food that the investigators have to go on, and then they always ask a question, isn't it a better way to do this? And a lot of them are familiar with REDCap, so we say, well, if you have a REDCap, you know, data mark that you're using to, you know, build your study on and run your study, why don't you send that data over there? So, you know, we wrote a tool for them to get access to that, and it's Biostats and DDP Happy, it makes nice data dictionaries and things. And it gives them granular and fine control and it goes back to the class, and it goes in a nice cycle here because they always ask questions. Um, here is a sample uh, REDCap integration, and part of the thing is is that you drag something over, and you kind of want an order of operations. You know, you kind of want to find uh, injuries first, or you know, COPD first. And a great big example of this is sort of a yes and no box, and I'll talk about that. Um, so they can drag in the order in which they want things to be classified uh, in terms of relative severity or, uh, or, or importance. And it does support things like uh, pick lists. So if you drag in a, a flow sheet that has a bunch of choices, you can pick which choice gets mapped to which field. And the basic way it works is that it takes the data that you've, uh, that you've written, the mappings that you've done in our tool, it takes the time, uh, the, the index state, that's very important. So in the, that Excel upload I mentioned before, since I2B2 doesn't have a concept of a study ID besides the patient dimension, you know, you need an index state to say this is the initial visit. So unless you make a data mark with just every encounter in there is a visit, the first visit, and your, uh, your, your patient cohort is the patient, uh, is the patient dimension, then you know you have to rely on an external table, which is where we use the Excel tool to leverage that. Um, however, our tools do function with just patient dimension and and, uh, and encounters. So, just taking a, a step back, you know, I wanted to say that uh, we want to talk about the use cases that we found for. And in this case, you know, a few ones that we have is that we have questionnaires that we send out to patients once a month and they fill it in, which is great. So they control that schedule within REDCap based on the visit functionality within REDCap. 
And that questionnaire should be built out, and I'll put this in air quotes, uh, the questionnaire should be built out the same way it is built out in your trial data management system like our EMR. Um, another common one is suppose you just have that but you only want just a few rows of data, in which in that case you can use the Excel spreadsheet and some Excel food. We've built out um, a bunch of uh, workflows for our institution. So we use uh, my charts for our studies um, and we also use smart data elements and here's a sample one you know, with a, uh, an eye exam that we built out on ontology spreadsheet. <coughs> And this is the one I wanted to get at, which is a yes and a no. So in these cases, you know, the investigator wants to ask, do you have a cold, yes or no? But then you really don't have anything to map to no. So we've actually had to unlimit things like gender and age because every patient should have an age or a gender. So make a, a Boolean yes. Now, time for some, you know, gotchas because you know when you return power to the investigators other than the obvious of you know you don't want the investigators taking unvalidated data and then going and publishing a paper on it uh, is uh, a bunch is these very curated points which is number one that our tool requires external time points so that was that table I was talking about before and generally the investigators don't build out their red cap studies quite as rigorously as uh, you would want them to so you kind of want to edit those projects a little bit. For example, they don't implement time points, which make time points not very <coughs> useful. Uh, so you have to put that as a forethought and an afterthought. Um, we also want to make sure that validations are off because if you have like a medication and you have a tilde or a minus sign, that doesn't work too well either. Um, getting back to the questionnaires or moving goalposts, uh, you really have to build those questionnaires ahead of time and you can't change them because if you change them, the mappings don't work because the questions are now different. You can't have your answer to be moved around a bit. So, you know, we've kind of had to lock that down and say, if you did that, you, you're on your own, sorry. Uh, can't change your study halfway through. Um, it's not so great. Um, also, our current tool isn't particularly fast and we're working on that. So it does take for about 3,000 patients and one cohort uh, to run 860,000 observations uh, to manipulate them. It took about the better part of uh, about a day and a half of crunching time on our server. Um, and also, investigators don't know what some things are documented on. For example, our special smoking history, which lives in 135 places. There's a paper in the atrium about that. It's great, I, I read it. It's quite an interesting poster. And uh, our investigators seem to assume things. When they see patient number, they assume it's the MRN go find out that's not a real MRN. So we had to build that. Um, this is a count from early of last year. And if you remember what I uh, described, uh, the, the counts went up at the beginning, at the later in the year when people do their research. Um, this is a basic count of how many Excel generations, red cap syncs, and chart reviews. One of the options in our tool is that you can click on a mapping and say render for this patient and then go to a chart review on it to make sure that our data is valid and that you're pulling the right thing. So with that, I wanted to also announce that we've made our tools open source. Um, they are available here. Um, and we are gonna also post our ETLs on Epic User Web. And a slide about me and my son. Thank you very much.